right. Ah, and it's Hannah. How's it going? Hi, guys. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Perfect. Wow, you got a flipping great setup. Okay, I can't hear you for some reason. Okay. Oh, no. Hand signals. <laughs> Technical uh. difficulties already is not a good sign. <laughs> nope. That's okay. Yes, I can. Oh, sweet. Good job. How's it going? It's just, it's been going really well. I've had <laughs> so many cool things happen since podcast movement just been on a roll i feel like so you know we met your podcast movement and you're like yeah cool let's let's you know i'll definitely come on the podcast it's re- it's great you know we're really like impressed by you not just by your amazing skills as a photographer but just as a person you know very inspiring indeed such a you know you're such a young lady and you just achieve so much which is really you know so impressive and people People need to hear that sort of story and, and feed off your energy and smile and stuff. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. That What an intro. Dang. Yeah, that's not even the intro. I mean, we haven't even started. <laughs> uh, cool you've got an, have you got the ATR over there, the uh, mic? Yep. Yeah, yes, I do. This is actually my mom's. Um, oh, it yeah. is a popular mic. She's, uh, I'm in her podcast recording studio right now. Oh, cool. Oh, brilliant. Yeah. She's... How's it going, Gareth? How you, my boy? Craig, how are you, my man? I'm good, thanks. And yourself, bud? Yes, I'm awesome, my man. How's your morning going? Yeah, it's very good. Thank you, buddy. Having a great day so far, nice and productive. How about yourself? Yeah, it's been a good day. Really awesome, my man. I'm excited to get into this chat with a vibrant and exciting young woman. Yeah, we had a great chat. Um, we spoke to a young lady whose 21st birthday was actually yesterday, uh, Hannah Phillips. <laughs> <laughs> so a bit about Hannah. Hannah is a born and bred uh, Pittsburgh girl. Uh, Hannah was homeschooled from kindergarten to seventh grade with her three younger siblings. Who she is today and the outlook she has on life, she owes to her parents for homeschooling her. Anna is definitely wise and sophisticated beyond her years. This lady is an incredible inspiration indeed. And like we said, yesterday was actually her 21st birthday, which is rather exciting. Hannah started her first business when she was 10 years old, can you believe? And now she runs two successful businesses. Hannah is a coffee addict, a Pittsburgh advocate, a college opt-out, Harry Potter nerd, wannabe author, artist, entrepreneur, creator, and leader. Hannah believes one of her missions on this earth is to help other young creatives realize just how possible it is to build a creative career for themselves. And if she can do it, they can too. Hannah is the founder of Hannah Phillips Media and the chief creative officer at Piper Creative. And... In this chat, we got into some really great topics, didn't we, Craig? Yeah, we did, Gareth. Uh, we were really blown away by a chat with this young and vibrant, exciting, uh, and uh, really switched on uh, Hannah Phillips. And we spoke about how Hannah actually credits homeschooling uh, for her many successes in her, in her uh, young life. We also spoke about what it's like to start a business a business at the tender age of 10 years old and why tapping into your creativity and exploring fun in your life is so important. We also got onto why the old school way of your stock standard sort of university uh, education is actually dead. And we also got onto a new way of building your brand through documenting as a service, which they offer at Piper Creative how she stays on top of trends in social media. And she gives us a whole bunch of tips on how to use Instagram well and efficiently. We also got onto how Hannah is actually a firm believer in the law of attract- attraction, which is really interesting. And she, we also got onto some sort of more adult topics. <laughs> if you think about how screen time can stunt the imagination of youngsters and old alike. And why it's such a passive way of consuming information. 
we also ended off on uh, the, the, we ended off by talking about her personal challenges, which she does. And that currently she's busy doing a, a painting a day for 30 days in a row, which is amazing. And we discuss why personal challenges are actually so important for us all to do. So Gareth, we have some thoughts on homeschooling ourselves, haven't we? Yeah, we do indeed, Craig. And I'm a big fan of homeschooling. Uh, I don't have my own kids yet, um, but I definitely will homeschool my kids, um, I think. Um, Marissa and I have spoken about it, and it's something we're both keen to do. And it's primarily down to, I guess, the kids that I've met that have been homeschooled. I met some in South America who was so switched on, so worldly and wise. And, you know, speaking to Hannah in, in this podcast was just another reason to kind of believe in it and just see just how amazing she was and her, her view in the world or of the world. So yeah, big fan. Um, and she sent, she gave us some good tips indeed on like, you know, how the kids can still be social and things like that. So I'm now even more of an advocate of it. Yeah. And how about yourself, Craig? Oh, no, 100%. Uh, totally, uh, 100% think it's a great idea. Uh, like you said, some of the most switched on people we know are, have come through the, that kind of system, uh, including Dali and Finn, who we spoke to a few episodes ago, and the super inspiring youngsters and so much creativity. And for some reason, they, the people that have gone through homeschooling just seem to really embrace that creativity more than, than others, don't you think? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> and um, I guess now anyway is a good time for us to hear what it's like for Hannah Phillips to be ridiculously human. Waking at dawn. Back okay, well, good afternoon there. Hannah Phillips from Pittsburgh. How are you doing today? I'm doing fantastic. Thank you so much for having me on. Uh, it's our yeah, we're pleasure. excited to chat to you today. I'm sorry, can you repeat that? <laughs> no, we just said it's, a, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. Oh, oh my gosh. Sorry. Yeah, I missed it. I think all, all this hair gets in the way sometimes. But. <laughs> <laughs> That's classic. So the last time we actually saw you was earlier on this year and actually the first time we met you. Uh, you we met you at the podcast movement in um philadelphia which was really awesome and we actually have a big thank you to say for taking us some amazing photos like mm. we you literally we met you there craig organized you know he spoke to you found out about you and you said yeah no i do photography and stuff and he's like oh i don't suppose you could take a few photos for us and <laughs> Literally, they were the most amazing photos ever. So, it's, you know, and we're using them everywhere now. So thank you so much for doing that. Yeah. I am so happy that you guys like them. That was such a fun shoot. I always like to explore whatever city I'm in and document it with my camera and just share my, my passions with people. So that was such a fun little afternoon. I love it. Was it was awesome. It actually, it was, I was thinking about it. It was one of those moments where, you know, in life, you should definitely take the, the certain decisions, right? So when I saw, when I went to the one track that we were in a podcast conference, there was a whole row of open chairs. And then there was these two ladies at the end. I was like, well, I was, the easy way is I'm going to sit here or I can go sit right next to you. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I went all the way down and I sat next to you. I thought I want to meet some people. So then I sat next to you and your mom. And, uh, and actually how it went down is you actually offered to take some photos, which was really cool. It's like, you were, you were the one going, you know, like I'm so passionate about what I do. And like, we, we were kind of chit chatting during the chat actually, which was probably naughty, but, and, and <laughs> we were just like so passionate about, and, and, and that passion was like, wow, we, of course we want to get your photos. I just knew you were going to take great photos. And that's clearly transitioned into your business life now. Cause you, it's like, that just shows how much um, when someone's passionate about something, 
how much it just influences others. And I was like, what do you do? How do you do it? Just because of your passion. So keep that up. It's awesome. So thank you. For I'm, that. yeah, I'm really glad that comes through. I, I really, really just hope to radiate that passion, that joy that for what I do and spread it to other people. That's, that's the best thing you can do for people, right? Is just give them that positive energy and they take it back and it builds that momentum and, I mean, that, that weekend or the, those couple of days were so, so awesome because that's the attitude that every single person there brought. They were just so excited to be around people who love the same things as them and just, it was awesome. Yeah, tell me about it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you've actually got a big day coming up this month, haven't you? It's your 21st birthday, which that's is exciting. right. <laughs> yes. Yes, my 21st birthday. I actually, I, I don't have major plans for the birthday itself. Um, my birthday fell on a Tuesday this year and you can't really go too, too wild on a Tuesday. <laughs> uh, but no, I think I'm going to spend some time with my family and then the, the following weekend, I'm going to go out with some friends and celebrate. Oh, that's really <laughs> that's awesome. awesome. So, and, and Henny. Go for it, guys. Yeah, no, you go ahead, Craig. No, that's good. So I was just going to say, so, you know, you've got a, a real interesting entrepreneurial journey and a really interesting life. And, you know, as Gareth said, you're only turning 21 soon. So this is quite incredible, really. Um, but we'd love to, like, go along your journey thus far. And uh, uh, as a youngster, you were um, uh, homeschooled until uh, about seventh grade. Uh, mm -hmm. Can we go into that a little bit and... Uh, explore what that was like for you yeah absolutely ask away <laughs> <laughs> well, what was it like like i mean you know being homeschooled did you start off homeschooled or did you how so did it how it started i i went to a private preschool and every year after that from kindergarten through seventh grade i was homeschooled and i credit homeschooling to everything that I have and everything that I am today. I, it shaped me as a human and I got to really just discover who I was. You know, people, kids my age, they always talk about having these, you know, identity crises and, you know, having to find themselves. And I just, I could never relate to that because homeschooling for me was the best thing that could have come about as, at such a young age. I was able to spend hours upon hours just discovering different interests and passions and trying new things. And I, I learned what I wanted to learn. Um, yeah, it was, it was really quite incredible. And along with that, um, my three younger siblings were homeschooled along with me. And it just forged such a deeper bond with all of us. And, and we had again like the the great relationship with my parents it just it all came from homeschooling and i'm just so grateful for it wow that's yes. amazing so Brilliant. what 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 does a, like a typical day you know consist of when you're at school at home <laughs> yeah so i remember i would wake up spend a decent number of hours in my pjs um <laughs> and my typical schooling routine took about two hours at the most. So I would get done what I had to get done. And then I had all this free time to paint or read or, you know, play outside. It just, it was the most epic childhood I could have asked for, quite <laughs> honestly. And I don't express that to my mom enough. Like I don't, you know, thank her enough for it. But it was truly just the best thing that could have happened. So, so would she, so would she encourage you like, okay, now schooling's done. Um, and obviously she was there with you guys and then she'd say, okay, now you've got some time to explore something you want to, or would she say, okay, today we're going to do, you're going to read or you're going to, you're going to paint or do you know what I mean? Or would she yeah, say, okay, no, this is the time to explore really, stuff you enjoy. Right. No, there really wasn't structure around it. And I found out very quickly that there were specific things I really enjoyed and gravitated towards. So like I mentioned, I would spend hours painting and drawing and pack sketchbooks with scenes from my own head. And 
Um, just my imagination was on fire as a kid. And I'm trying to regain that today because, you know, growing up in a digital age it is difficult. But, uh, but yeah, I would spend hours drawing and reading. I read books by the stack. Um, I just nourished my mind with stories and worlds that I wanted to dive into. And, um, and then I also grew up playing tennis. My dad is a professional tennis coach. So grew up with my dad as a coach and uh, took tennis pretty seriously until I was about 13. Um, and then I just started playing for the high school I attended. Wow. So uh, who does your dad like coach? Does he coach anyone we might know? Probably not. I'm trying to think. He he specializes in 12 and under um, kids. So he takes kids who are just learning the basics and builds up their core strengths from there. And his strategies are legendary. I will go to the grave saying that my dad is the best like young tennis coach on the planet because his like wow. his strategies are unique and very innovative and just stuff that every kid should learn if they want to take up tennis but uh, but yeah and I was lucky enough to have all of that drilled into me from a young age <laughs> and um, and I, I love the sport I I'm not the most competitive person but tennis was so fun for me that I you know, love being able to spend that time with him and then, you know, do clinics and classes with other kids. It was, it was really fun. And then smash all your mates that you were playing against. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> what, in regards to the homeschooling, were, were both your parents like, no, we, we, this is definitely something we want for our kids or like what sort of led them to go down that pathway? That's a really interesting question. Um, it wasn't something that was automatic. I think, so my mom saw how I um, was reacting to preschool and I definitely enjoyed going to school every day, but what with three other very young kids, it just wasn't super practical to um, have one or two of them have their own schooling schedule and then, you know, have to pick them up and deal with the other two. And so it, um, it really, and also she just, I, n none of my family is a huge fan of the public schooling system. <laughs> um, sure. I totally respect the teachers bringing their, um, their passions and their knowledge to the classroom but the public schooling system in America as a whole, we're just not extreme fans of. So I, um, the decision was largely based around the fact that they just felt that we would learn more and learn faster and grow up to be more passionate people if we were homeschooled. And it did, worked. yeah, yeah, it did work. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I think that um, a lot of people kind of worry about homeschooling in a way that, well, one of the concerns at least is that the social element is missing. So how did you guys get around that part or was it not an issue? Right, right. Um, luckily enough, there, my neighborhood growing up was packed to the brim with kids our age and so every single day when we would finish our schooling and go off and do whatever we wanted we would just wait around for the school kids to get home so we could play <laughs> with them and our backyard was just this big thing everyone came to play kickball and wiffle ball and ultimate frisbee um, our backyard was the magnet for the neighborhood kids it was pretty pretty fun but um, but aside from that you know, I took tennis classes from a very young age. I enrolled in different art classes. Um, but yeah, the social thing was never a huge concern for me. I am very introverted naturally. I just, I love having my alone time. I can legitimately go weeks without having to interact with people. Not that it's enjoyable. I'm just very neutral about it. I, mm. um, I get a lot of energy from just being alone and 
doing my own thing. So um, it didn't, the social aspect of homeschooling didn't make a huge impact on me just because I spent my days doing stuff that energized me anyway. Oh, that's awesome. That's, it just sounds so amazing. Eh? And, and so <laughs> would you, it just seems to make so much sense that you'd have your schooling done then you'd have time to like do your thing. And then when the other, so then you'd actually almost have a, an extra third that other kids don't have, you know, like that time where you get to explore your own creativity and stuff. Whereas the other kids would be like, you know, force fed at school and then they play. It's only two things basically. And then maybe some of them would go and read and stuff, but mostly you want to hang out with your mates then obviously, you know? So then at least you had that time in between where you got to like read and draw and stuff where, I'm sure other kids might not have. So you, it's a whole extra like chunk to a day. I think it's really valuable. So tell us more about your drawing and your art and your painting. Like where, like how did that develop and, and what do you enjoy about it at the moment? Oh my gosh. That's such a loaded question for me. Cause <laughs> it is, I mean, it is my one true passion in life is art and creating things on canvas or paper, what have you. Um, I, I think I started drawing as soon as I could hold a crayon in my chubby toddler hands. Like I <laughs> was always drawn to it, no pun intended. Um, but yeah, I, I've been doing it for as long as I can remember. And it just evolved so naturally. Um, yeah, it was my favorite way to spend time. And pretty much still is and just just a little bit about your mom like so what did her kind of day look like she would you know teach you guys and then she was also studying if I'm right at the time so she would teach us you know get all of our schooling done and then I mean being a mom is a full-time job obviously so uh, she was practicing law when we were very young. I remember her going to work maybe when I was four, three or four years old and having a babysitter at that time. But, uh, but she became a full-time stay-at-home mom and teacher, uh, after, I think after I turned four, somewhere around there, um, because my siblings and I were all very close in age. I am as mentioned, about to turn 21. My uh, younger brother just turned 20, so we are 11 months apart. Uh, and then my sister's 18, and my youngest brother is 16. So she had a gaggle of <laughs> tiny kids, all like under the age of five, um, for, you know, for many years. So she gave up her uh, job, became a stay full time stay at home mom, and uh, her days just revolved around us learning and hopefully not tearing each other's hair out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. And, and is, did you, you went back to school eventually, did you, like around about grade eight? How, how did that go? Like, how did you integrate back in and what was the feeling like for you? It was a looking back hindsight is 2020 right it was probably the most bizarre way to get back into school because in eighth grade i applied to and got accepted to a um this art school it's a charter school so any kids from any county in western pennsylvania were able to apply with whatever skill they had, they had different departments. So there were, there was literary arts, media arts, which I was in dance, musical theater. So kids came from all across Western Pennsylvania, um, to go to this specific art school. And because of that, my bus ride was an hour and a half there and back. So my first introduction to, you know, quote, real school was, three hours on a bus every day you know an hour and a half to three hours of art classes and then you know decent amount of time spent in the regular core curriculum things that you have to cover in school but it was it was probably the best way to be introduced to a regular school system because I still had specific dedicated time um, for art 
which was awesome. And the bus ride, I was able to either get homework done or sleep or draw whatever I wanted to do. So it was, um, you know, I, I eventually left after two years because I couldn't stomach the fact that I was in fact spending three hours inside a moving tin box. But, uh, but yeah, it was, it was a good experience overall. Huh. And in terms of the art, was that like a, a boost or a, did, did it actually give you something in terms of your art? That's a very interesting question. It was, so it was the first time that I ever took assignments and did specific projects that I didn't give myself or worked on things and skills that I wasn't trying to self evolve. Um, so in that sense, it was very good for learning and growing. But I also, I'm not the classroom type of person. And I prefer to not be assigned work, you know, hence being my own boss today. Um, it just that is always stuck with me. And so while I definitely in enjoyed the fact that I was able to take these art classes with amazing teachers. Um, I, the, the fact that they were assignments kind of tarnished it a little bit. It's, it's that thing, you know, a kid could love to read, but as soon as they're assigned to read a specific book in school, they don't like that book because it's work, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, it, it had a little bit of, a little bit of that thrown into it. Yeah. Yeah. So what is so fascinating, right? Or just inspiring is that in grade 10, you started your first business, HP media, like where did this sort of entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial <laughs> flair come from? And you know, what, what was the business sort of when you first started? Yeah, so when I first started HP Media, I was com coming off of the two years I had spent in school and I spent a year cyber schooling. So I had the, all this time back. Um, I, I, I mean, time is obviously our most important resource. So I was gifted the gift of time and I thought, what can I do with this? So um, at that point, I had developed my photography skills to well enough to where I felt comfortable charging people for shoots. And I also um, built my drawing and painting skills up to a point where I felt like, oh, okay, if someone wanted, to, wanted me to sketch them a portrait, here's how much it would cost. So I knew I had these skills built up to a point where I could start charging people. Um, and it just made sense to put it all under this umbrella brand of HP Media. So at the time, it was photography, visual arts, drawing and painting, and uh, graphic design. So designing logos and brand packages and whatnot. Wow. And, and so where did that skill evolve from? The graphic the, the, design? Yes. Oh, my gosh. I actually totally forgot about this until just now. But when I was... 10 years old, I think I started a blog, um, just wrote down little daily <laughs> happenings of 10 year old <laughs> Hannah's life. Uh, Ooh. but what came from that was I had to design myself a logo and, you know, design the website itself. And so that's where the graphic design thing started. And then, oh man, all these things are flooding back to me now. Just thinking about my childhood, I would, I would design little blog buttons for other people and internet friends oh, that wow. I made. And so it, it really came from, you know, doing free work at first and then, um, yeah, eventually being able to charge people. Wow. Incredible. So, so that was 10 years ago. Is that right? Or, yes. Yeah, oh my gosh. That <laughs> makes me feel so old. Oh and wow. <laughs> you're so old. Yeah, no. Shame. Uh, it's, it's downhill from here. <laughs> <laughs> it's incredible. 10 years old and you're starting to earn money, you know, like for yourself. That's, that must have made you, I guess, in a way sort of feel quite proud. Or was your mom like, no, no, you know, I'll keep this money for you. How did that all work? work itself out yeah no when I so when I was 10 and I did the, the blog it was literally I would charge maybe five dollars for a little photoshop design button and 
I would have to use my mom's PayPal account, but she was so into the idea of me being a little entrepreneur <laughs> that uh, she obviously would give me what was owed to me. <laughs> but yeah, at that time I didn't even have a, a PayPal, a bank account hooked up or credit card, obviously. So yeah, it was, it was, uh, we had to navigate those hurdles as they came. You know what I find fascinating, Hannah, is that you understood your worth from a young age, which I think is a, an issue that a lot of people, myself included with certain things, you know, like you knew, okay, my work's actually good enough to charge someone for. Uh, and I think that's, uh, it's such an amazing thing to, to have. And, and how did you, was that just a feeling that you got, or did you actually sit down and think about it? Okay, I, I need to start charging. Or did you just kind of intrinsically know like, okay, this kind of work is charged for, if you know what I mean? It was, it was pretty intuitive and came fairly naturally just because I recognized that what I was doing, I, I had all of this time and all these years to build up these skills when the other kids my age weren't doing anything like it. And so I recognized like what I'm doing right now is the same thing that a 20, 22, 24 year old photographer would be doing. I've spent as many years practicing my craft as they have, I'm just 10 years younger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh, that's wow. incredible. Yeah, that is. Yeah, definitely. So just, just one thing that you, you touched on just now, you, you did cyber school. Like I'm just assuming that was like online. Like what, how did that sort of come about? So what was it? Yeah, cyber school. So I did cyber school because for so many different reasons, one of them being that I didn't really want to spend uh, three years going to my local public high school. I ended up going there for two years, my last two years of high school, but uh, cyber school came about because I genuinely really missed the time that I was able to spend before I started school um, working on the things that I loved. So that was that was the ultimate reason my schooling my daily schooling routine was still able to be kept under three hours um yeah i it, it was it was more so that was the year that i dedicated to building hp media and putting that brand around myself and, and tell us a bit about the photography we haven't really explored that at all um did you did that follow on from your art and you were just you, you just enjoyed beautiful things or had someone said hey you should you should give this a go how did how did your skill or your love for photography evolve yeah so i think i was probably 10 or 11 the first time i tried using my mom's little point and shoot camera and i spent 3 years using that and playing around with that until i was i think i was 14 when i uh, for my birthday, I split uh, the cost of a nice professional DSLR camera. And from there, I just practiced and practiced and did so much free work. Um, and at that time, um, I was a freshman in high school. And because I was going to this art school, I was able to take headshots for all the theater majors. I was able to take you know, all these dance action shots for my dance friends. Uh, it was really something that I was able to practice a lot. And I also took um, a couple of photography classes at the art school. So yeah, it was, it, it, it just evolved naturally from my love of, I guess, aesthetically pleasing things and being able it's its own form of art so For sure. yeah. Did, yeah did you notice that you were sort of more wise than your fellow students oh man it sounds slightly egotistical to say yes however i don't think i thought of it as wisdom or superiority I just knew that I was m more introspective than a lot of people that were surrounding me at that age um, and that definitely came from just being around 
my parents and my siblings for so many more hours than these kids were around their families. I mean, I literally spent every single day with my family. And because of that, I was brought up on so strongly on these rules of respect and um, integrity and just showing empathy. Um, yeah, I, I, I definitely, I knew I was slightly more reserved, slightly more introspective than my classmates, but uh, that I, I I love the friends that I've made at every every school I attended. The art school, um, I am still like in touch with a couple of close friends from my public high school. Uh, yeah, I just I I wanted to surround myself with people who shared my same values and being able to kind of take a step back in the moment and realize like that person or this person they are really behaving in the same way that I am. Um, that's how I kind of found my tribe within those schools. And your brothers and sisters, um, are they on a similar journey? What, where are they at at the moment, more or less? Or is it a big mix? Right. No. So my youngest brother is a junior in high school, which is so crazy. He just started to drive. It's, it's weird. <laughs> it's so weird. Uh, he's such like, he's still the baby of the family in all of our heads. Um, but yeah, he's a junior in high school and is attending um, our local public school. And he's just, he has owned that school from the moment he stepped inside like as a seventh grader everyone loves him he is such a joy oh my gosh he's a character um so yeah he's in public school my sister is she graduated high school early she had built up enough credits homeschooling and attended public school for a year i think and then finished her credits homeschooling um, so she graduated early and is planning a trip to Barcelona this October. She's spending several months in Spain, uh, learning Spanish, doing this um, immersion school thing. She's doing her own thing. She's m much more creative than I am. She just hasn't found the right platform to exert her entrepreneurial instincts, I don't think. But, um, but she is currently find, finding that and I'm watching it unfold before my eyes and it's the coolest thing. Um, and then my, my brother who's 11 months younger than me, he finished, oh, he is a, just started his sophomore year of college. He's playing division one tennis. Uh, he, he took his tennis career very seriously. He's extremely skilled as an athlete. Um, yeah, so he's going to college and getting that done, grinding it out. <laughs> and your proud folks, parent. yeah, I was just literally going to say that you must have <laughs> seriously proud parents. <laughs> I, you know, what's funny is my mom doesn't like to take credit for how we turned out. She, she always says like, oh, it's just natural. There, it's. It, you know, they were born with it. But I'm like, no, this, I mean, I credit so much of where I am today to my parents. They just are two really awesome people. Yeah. I mean, we've met your mom and she's a yeah. super humble, nice, smart lady. And she definitely has a lot, you know, Oh, you know, she, she has to take a lot of credit for it for sure. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Cause when we, you know, when we spoke to her, she, she also had this, real like spark to her that drew us to, to to talk to her and she she's one of these just like yourself and someone that listens and she looks you in the eye and like you know and both of you have that skill and that takes you a long way so it's a it's a really awesome thing that um, I'm sure that that your mom had and now you have you know what I mean so she can definitely take a lot of that um, credit I agree with you you know yeah, I agree. I mean, I was raised by them. So sometimes it is hard. It's it's e easy to take that for granted. But especially after moving out and getting my own place and just seeing, looking back at how much they did for us and how how much of their character is in me. It's it's pretty crazy. It's awesome. Yeah. And after school, if I'm right, you went to, uh, I don't know what, what to call it, but it was a place called Praxis. Yes. And okay. 
I would love to know more about that because I was actually looking at their website uh, yesterday mm-hmm. and I was like, this is the way forward. It's really, you know, sort of forward thinking in terms of education and uh, really sets kids and people that go through their program up well, doesn't it? Absolutely. I'm so glad that you said that because it truly is the way forward. It's the future of education after high school. Um, yeah. So Praxis, when I did it, I started it in 2016. Since then, they've tweaked the program a little bit, but it's the core of it is pretty much the same. So when I did the program, it's this, I like to call it an academically infused apprenticeship and entrepreneurship program. So when I applied, they have this whole application process, which Apparently, they just rebooted, which is awesome. It's just continuing to grow and be innovative. But I applied. I got accepted. And the first two months of it is a professional skills boot camp. So there there was 30 days of writing. Like, you have to publish a blog post every single day. There was um, specific books that you had to read and takeaways that you had to come up with. And it was ultimately learning in two months what you needed to survive in the real world um, in in corporate America or in more of an entrepreneurial setting. It was just a professional skills boot camp that really whipped you into shape and got you thinking, how can I provide value? Um, And I was drawn to the program because, oh my gosh, the backstory of this is absolutely insane. I don't know if we want to get into it at all. Um, So when I was in high school, I was at my public school, I cold called my way into a job at the Pittsburgh Professional Ultimate Frisbee team as the photographer. So I was shooting pictures for this Frisbee team. And one of the guys on the team had a podcast called Going Deep with Aaron Watson. His name was Aaron Watson. And when I started shooting for them, I started listening to his podcast and one of his guests was someone who worked for Praxis. Hmm. And that same guy who worked for Praxis two weeks later actually showed up to my public high school and to speak to a handful of students about Praxis. It was this whole like divine, weird, coincidental series of things that happened. But, uh, But yeah, I ended up talking with this guy, um, Zach Slayback, and he convinced me to apply to the program, and I was super into it, and yeah, I applied, I got in, and side note, now Aaron Watson, the guy on the Frisbee team, is he's my business partner now Uh in Piper Creative, so three years, it's come full circle, it's really quite bizarre. Huh. Wow, it's incredible. I just love how you take initiative, you know, like a cold call. That's what it takes sometimes. And then being open to things that are, or the synchronicity in life, you know, you're like, oh, look at that. There's that guy again. And you're just being aware of it and open to it. Oh my gosh. It, it's something that I am so consciously aware of now. Um, yeah, I, I 100%, I don't know if this is too woo-woo for your audience. I'm hoping not, but I am 100% a believer in the law of attraction and what you put out gets, you know, delivered right back to you and manifestation. And so I think, um, yeah, just continuing to put out those positive vibes, it'll, it'll be delivered right back to you. That's so, that's so cool. And it's, it's incredible to talk about that because I've actually been working really closely with a really good friend of mine. His name is also Gareth. And he was also actually on our podcast um, a while back. And obviously, he's good friends with Craig too. And uh, he's working on a course, a uh, coaching course for Law of Attraction. Good. No. Yeah, yeah. Oh my so, gosh. So it's uh, you you'll know, have I mean, to let me know when that comes out because I will hop on it immediately. Yeah. Okay, I'll awesome. I'll definitely let him know. And <laughs> <laughs> so so just a bit more about praxis. What is the actual? What do they teach you exactly? Yeah. So they teach you a lot in the professional skills boot camp, and that's kind of your introduction to uh, real work. And then after that. Um, 
you get placed with a startup or a business and not in an internship role, but they call it an apprenticeship. So you're doing real things. You're providing real value to this company and you're essentially treated as a real employee. You're just there through praxis. And so you do all the day-to-day tasks that whatever this apprenticeship might bring you and deliver on those. And along with that, there are certain modules in the Praxis course that you have to complete. And um, yeah, it's, it's overall just designed to teach you everything that college won't. <laughs> hmm, that's so good. And is it classroom based or is it based online? It's not, it's all online. Yeah, and then they, um, they place you with specific businesses you can request to be placed at somewhere within your city but a lot of my good friends have had to travel from across the country one of my closest friends now um, she got placed at a business in Pittsburgh and I got to know her through the Praxis program and now she is like full-time living here works at this company full-time and started um started there as an employee after the program was done. That's the coolest thing about the program itself is they pretty much guarantee you a really well-paid job at the end of it because you're proving to your employer that you can provide value and that you're, um, you have what it takes to be a full-time employee. Jeez, it's so valuable. It's, such it's, a- it's amazing. It's, it's mind blowing that people st- still are going to college when programs like this exist because Mm -hmm. for me, I was placed at um, a digital marketing agency for my apprenticeship and there I was 18 years old among 25, 26, 27 year olds upwards um, doing the same exact things that they were doing, but I still had the skills to get it done properly. So just praxis is the thing of the future. Well That's done. Magical. So, so off the back of that, uh, Hannah, you've now taken things even a step further. You've got your one business ticking over well, HP Media, and you meet Aaron. Is that right? Um, and and you guys make mates. So now you've you open up your your second business uh, and Piper Creative. Yes. Uh, so tell us a little bit about your your current business uh, and uh, Aaron a little bit as well and let us know what, what you guys are up to there. Yeah, for sure. So we started Piper in the beginning of this year. So we're still a fairly young company. Uh, we provide pr- uh, podcast production. We build Instagram accounts and we have designed this service that we call documentary as a service. So essentially professional vlogging. And we, Aaron originally pitched me the idea of, you know, vlogging as a service back in 2017, like towards the middle of the year. And every time I saw him after that, whether it was for a random photo shoot or at a ultimate frisbee game I would always ask him like so what are you doing with this idea and then earlier this year he asked me to be his co-founder in the company where we actually would provide this to um, business owners and entrepreneurs and all you you name it and we will deliver it to whoever it needs to be my my ultimate goal with this is to sign with a major sports organization i think the mlb has to hop on this documentary as a service deal asap because so many reasons but <laughs> uh but yeah so we we um, provide professional vlogging. We have an internal company vlog ourselves. So you can go back and watch the very first day Aaron and I started working together. Um, you can watch the first in, you know, watch us hire our first intern um, and just see what goes into growing a media company. It's, it's pretty cool. I'm going to say it's really impressive. I was <clears throat> looking on your website uh, this week and you explain very nicely what you do, like all the steps. It's very concise and informative and it's really engaging too. I was like, I really want to work with these guys. Like, like it's really, you've, you've done it really well. Like, and, um, 
just that part is impressive. You know, you've sort of engaged people through the way you tell a story. Um, did you learn like how to do that at all? Is it something that's just come natural to you? Cause that's like a big element, I guess, of marketing and stuff too. Yeah. So I, I think I have pretty natural marketing instincts, but the storytelling and the copywriting specifically is all Aaron. He is a whiz at copywriting and knows how to set up these stories so that they will be engaging. He will be thrilled to hear that you, you enjoyed the website. Um, but yeah, so I, he's the CEO. I'm the chief creative officer. Uh, so I handle all things visual and aesthetics and all this visual content creation. But um, going back to the original question is the storytelling is at our core. That's what we want to get across most with Piper is just teaching people and telling these engaging stories for other business owners and entrepreneurs um, and organizations. But what is really interesting that I noticed that you said is that it's pretty concise. Our website is fairly concise and we lay out specifically what we can do. And that is, that was very intentional. We didn't want to start Piper um, as this full service digital agency that we can do everything under the sun. We provide everything. And when you say that you can provide everything, people really don't know what you can do for them and so we wanted to lay out very specifically this is what we do this is how we can help you yeah it's very interesting because we've actually sort of started learning a bit more about storytelling ourselves recently and there was one book in particular called uh, story brand scripts um by a guy called donald miller and it's it's really like when you start understanding how to tell a good story, you notice, you notice the good websites from the kind of average websites and you know, the, the way people sort of position their companies. It's a, it certainly is an art and you kind of, you don't know it until you actually read these sort of books and you go, ah, okay, that's what you're supposed to do. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And just, I'm trying to consume as much content like that as I can, especially now with I'm doing a little digital detox for the month of September. Um, but yeah, I will definitely check out that book. That's a good tip. Need yeah, to read it, that one. It is. It is I, a really I, good one. It, I would also rec- highly recommend it. It's like you know, it, it's so much. It's just to put it into a format that that is concise, like you say. It's just it's so valuable to be able to do that and use it as a as a skill, you know, it's, it's what links us all. We love stories, you know, but um, I actually must say just briefly, I love the, that vlog of you guys, you guys have got a good energy together and it's, it's, you just have a laugh and it's so like honest and open. And so that like, it's actually really enjoyable to watch, not just if you're trying to like, you know what I mean? Like not just learning about the, the, the business, but it's just fun to watch as well, which I think is, is really smart as well of you guys. And then you've got a good chemistry, which is, is really cool. But I wanted to ask you just briefly, documentary as a service, can you just explain that um, to us a little bit more? Like, what is that actually? What is, you know, what do you do with that? Yeah, so we titled it documentary as a service because not everyone knows what a vlog is. Like, you can't, especially some older business owners and CEOs that we really think would benefit from documenting their daily lives and what goes on in their businesses. Um, So coming to them with this specific term, documentary as a service, we're able to lay out in detail, like, what we're doing for you is documenting how you eat sleep and breathe maybe not sleep but (laughs) we 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 want to capture your daily life and turn it into interesting engaging content so that your customers and your clients kind of see what's going on behind the curtain um And especially, it's so funny that you mention like our internal, the Piper vlog, because personal brands are driven by the people behind them. And so many major corporate brands aren't giving you faces to root for, right? Mm -hmm. So that's what we ultimately want to provide is 
you know, people will take so much more stock into your company if you show them who it is that's running it and who started it and give them the backstory. And that's, that's what we're doing. Yeah. So vlogging, I guess, is, you know, one of many trends um, going, going on. Like what, what is the actual importance of it? Do you feel like for someone to, to talk about their daily life? Like why is it so important? And Right. So if it were up to me, every person would be documenting their life in one way or another, whether that's through a blog, a vlog, um, through their Instagram stories, what have you. I think everyone should be documenting because there's enormous value in documentation. One of my favorite examples is um, we were recently interviewing someone for Aaron's podcast and um, they, this woman, she owns a, uh, a mapping company, like a digital geographic something or other. I don't know the proper terminology, but we had this meeting with her and the podcast on film, obviously. Um, and she asked that very same question, like, why do you do this? Why are you documenting everything? Be and Aaron said, because in the year 2023, when you get asked to perform the U.S. census or what have you, when your company gets to that point, we'll be able to go back in our company vlog and show this exact past 30 seconds of me suggesting this. And we'll be able to create that tie for people and show that it's, it's all about community and creating these things where people are really able to be interwoven and really invested in your story. And, and how do you go about it? So do you have a team that sort of, okay, like I'm just imagining they, you, yeah, they, they wake up the person that you, you vlogging, you go over to their house and you're waiting for them with the camera and you're like, and a cool, coffee. Let's go. Yeah. And right. how, how do you do it? Like, yeah. Right. So right now I'm the only full-time camera person right now. Piper only has, Oh man, how many interns do we have? Five interns. Um, and they're unpaid. So Aaron and I are the only ones doing this full time, but I am the core camera person. So whatever meeting we have, I make sure there are at least, there's at least one camera set up to capture that meeting and whatever is going on, make sure we have it documented. Um, but yeah, for us, we, I just make sure like my camera is basically attached to me. I practically feel naked without it. It's like an extension of my body at this point. Um, so I document everything I go to, I go with Aaron to all of his meetings. And if I'm not able to be there, then one of our interns is there, um, ha and has the camera on him. But yeah, that's essentially how it works right now for, for clients we will have dedicated like, okay, show up at eight o'clock and you're just at this person's side for eight hours. And then you have to upload the footage and turn it into an engaging story and an engaging piece of content. And, and that, and that editing and stuff, some of your interns will take care of and that kind of thing as well. And yeah, it's it really hard. Cool. It's, it's a hurdle um, that we have, not quite not quite crossed yet just because we're still playing with like okay well if someone has all of this footage that they shoot it's really hard to take someone else's footage and turn it into a story just because you don't know precisely what went on throughout the day and you have to sit there and watch all eight hours of the story but for me what I like to do is I if I look at my schedule at the beginning of the day, I know what meetings I'm going to be in, what interviews Aaron is going to have. And so I already have this preconceived structure of how I can tell this day's story. And so I go into the day with my camera documenting everything. If I have, if there's something that someone says that I really like, I'll stick my thumb in front of the camera um, just as little thumbs up, like here's what we have to include. And I'll look for that when I'm scrubbing through the footage at the end of the cool. day. 
and I'll be able to take pieces. It makes the editing process so much faster. But if someone else was editing my footage, it would take them considerably longer to produce something. But it must take you ages anyway. Like, you know, if you're filming eight hours a day, it must really take a lot, long time to edit that. And I've, you have to post it every day, no doubt. So what's nice is we don't have a strict schedule like, okay, well, post one day and the next day it ha the episode has to be up. Um, we have backed up footage from about a week. So we'll record something and I can edit an episode of our vlog in maybe around two to three hours now. I've gotten it down considerably, considerably from where I started. I started and it was like six hours and it was so much more time consuming. But, um, but now I can edit an episode in around three hours and um, I, we have certain like specific episodes backlogged and a release schedule and um, we're just giving ourselves that leeway and uh, it makes things a whole lot easier. Hmm. How do you stay up to date with the trends in vlogging and social media and... Right, so I... I I don't know how long I've been doing this, but I always, whenever I'm on social media, I try to look at it not as just a passive consumer, but as a marketer. So I try to recognize the specific things that people do whenever they create their content. So whether that's, you know, a particular Instagram feed that's working in a pattern of images that flows really nicely or, um, or a blog post that has like different sentences that jump out at you that are designed to reel you in and, you know, anchor you towards buying a specific product. I, I try to consume content in a very engaged manner with an observant eye. Um, just because that, I mean, all art is stealing. You have to steal from your competitors. You have to come at it with that approach. And, um, being able to look at content in that way has really helped us develop where our brand is going and what our content is doing. Yeah, sure. So, so can we just like, you know, talk a little about Instagram because that's obviously the talk of the moment, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, why is it so important to have a, a good Instagram account? How do you have a good Instagram account? What are some of the important things people kind of need to know and should be doing? I love Instagram talk. First of all, I could, I could mm -hmm. rattle on about Instagram for hours, but <laughs> try to keep it concise. Um, so I personally have found that Instagram is super important for personal branding because when I was in high school and building up my business, uh, HP media, I got about 75% of my new clients through my Instagram page because of the very specially curated content that I posted. And what I mean by that is I designed my Instagram feed ahead of time. So I never really posted photos in real time. I would always take photos of what I wanted, what I know, knew I wanted to post in the moment. And then I would wait until the end of the day, upload everything that I have onto my computer, edit everything with the same filters and the same techniques, and then arrange photos specifically as to how the eye would be drawn to them when you're looking at the feed as a whole. And still making sure that every individual photo is high quality, uh, you know, just generally not a crappy photo not pixelated or anything so mm. so how, how would that work for like a client so say you we said okay cool we want to work with you as ridiculously human uh, do, mm -hmm. is that possible like someone overseas can work with you or is it generally someone closer to yeah you yeah absolutely we have one client right now where he sends us pictures that he's taken at 
you know, at the end of every week and we edit them in a specific way. We have his designated filter that we use for all of his pictures and that gives his overall feed a very unified look while still telling his personal brand's story. Um, so, and then there are other things that you can do. I don't know if you guys follow Gary Vaynerchuk on Instagram, but he's a great example of how you don't have to use exclusively photos. You can, you know, use pictures with text. You can, you know, do all these different ways and to manipulate headshots. And um, he utilizes video a lot, which is crucial. But, um, but yeah, there, there are just so many ways you, to get around the geographical you know, complications that we found. So yeah, it's definitely possible. And that, that will, that would, would tie into like the scalability of your business, I guess you, to be able to work, not just on location. Yeah, absolutely. That That's so crucial because right now I am the only photographer that the team has. I, I mean, we're, I'm training a few of the interns, like how, how to use a DSLR camera and the basics of shooting a manual and, you know, having an eye for the rule of thirds and all this different stuff. But I'm the only one who has the experience that is needed to produce client level work. And um, so being able to work with clients overseas or not based in Pittsburgh is pretty crucial because I don't have to worry about dedicating 10, 15 hours a week on photo shoots, which does, it's t very time consuming. And then editing after that, I cut out the shooting part entirely and I just have to worry about the editing. And, and that's something that is also trainable to the interns. So. Yeah. It's, it sounds pretty like full on to me. You must have a seriously busy schedule each day. I do. What's, what's really nice about it though is um, Aaron and I have gotten really, really good at packing specific days of the week to the brim. Um, so we'll have maybe four or five meetings in one day and then a couple of off days and then another really busy day. And so that just really helps with the, the vlog schedule, it helps with, you know, just to catch up with editing because Aaron has a ton of business development stuff that he's doing for Piper on those off days and he has to edit his podcast episodes. So yeah, it just, it, it really helps to be very strategic in when we schedule meetings and who they're with and where they are. It's uh, we've we've gotten really good at that over time. It started out where it was very scattered and kind of hectic, but um, but it's just a muscle that you have to train and learn what's totally. best for you. Mm -hmm. It's you interesting. Can, you can, one can fit so much more into a specific a lot a lot of time more than you think. Always like I always realize that so often is that like if you if you put you, if you put the time frame down you can do it as long as you, it's time, really good time management, which you've learned to the young age, which is pretty awesome actually. Yeah, it's, it's definitely beneficial to have a lot of things on the schedule because that does force you to use your time wisely. I had, I mean, I had to learn that through trial and error though. I, I still consider time management one of my weak points, which is crazy. Um, but yeah, it's just something that I'm, I constantly have to work on. Well, we'll give you a bit of slack. I mean, you, you know, <laughs> <21 years. laughs> that's the street ahead of probably many people that are our age and older. So well done. <laughs> <laughs> um, just before we move away from uh, Instagram, like wh what are your thoughts on say using stories versus actual posting photos? Like, you know, what's the percentage that you think is better? Right. Yeah. Right. I, so I'm of the strong opinion that you should use your stories more so in a documentarian type of way. So people tend to get really frustrated with accounts that post more than two times a day on their actual Instagram feed. But if you have a lot of high quality images that you want to share, Instagram stories is the is a great way to post those and let them be seen. Um, 
it just is another outlet to share your skills and people can obviously choose whether or not they want to click on your story or watch it. Um, yeah, I, I try to utilize Instagram stories as much as I can while still keeping a very curated feed. So right now, I haven't been on my Instagram stories quite as much because I'm t doing the little digital detox, but, um, but I'm still able to, that's where I post my daily paintings. I, it, it's up for 24 hours and at the end of the month, I'll create a little story highlight with all 30 paintings because um, I'm doing the 30 paintings and 30 days challenge. But, but yeah, I, I absolutely love Instagram stories. It's also a great tool to get comfortable speaking to the camera because every single person on this earth has their own perspective on an issue or on a skill or they know they have some form of knowledge that should be shared. And if you're not comfortable sitting down and producing a vlog or doing a whole long video, then just pop on Instagram stories and do a couple like four 30 second videos of you talking up about a specific subject and asking for your followers input like oh what do you think of this and it's just a really easy hack to grow those you know public speaking skills or mm. storytelling skills love instagram stories hmm. so you were mentioning you reckon everyone should be on you know putting up content like this what are the like if you say i've got a personal brand do you suggest a blog a vlog Instagram stories and like, do you, do you reckon you should do them all or should you like um, zone in on one that you really good at or enjoy? It's a really good question. So I am of the strong opinion that more content is always better. Um, however, if you know you're really good at taking pictures, for example, then you should put more energy into building your Instagram page or maybe um, crafting really engaging high quality Instagram stories, then if, if you're not that skilled at filmmaking, you shouldn't try to fumble with something and, you know, produce an inordinate amount of content that you're not comfortable with if you don't want to make a vlog. Um, but yeah, I mean, Instagram is such a great starting point because it lets you get practice copywriting. It lets you train your eye for the visual aesthetic side of things. And it also gives you an outlet to talk to the camera and get comfortable with that. Yeah. Yeah. It's also interesting. Eh? Like it's amazing how life has just sort of moved on. Not in your, I guess in your lifetime, but for us, all this stuff is like, <laughs> <laughs> it's so, so I, different should i say i like to argue though that i am of the last generation that actually did grow up like playing outside and whatever i think my people my age get a lot of flack for not you know being addicted to their phones always but i i think that we were able to grow and evolve with it but still kind of remember what it was like without it it's homeschooling <laughs> schooling it has to be the homeschooling i guess <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, it's it's so it's so interesting because actually a guy that we're chatting to on uh monday he's, he's a good friend of mine he we literally messaged just you know a bit before this and he was like he really feels thankful for when we grew up as kids because we, we weren't we didn't have phones and uh, we weren't addicted to social media and stuff and I think I agree. I'm so I'm I'm fortunate that we've seen both sides of it, you know. And I, but I really do actually feel kind of sorry for kids now that that's kind of what they're addicted to, you know, and that's what all they know. Yep, yep. I totally agree. I I I still think that screen time should be limited among young kids. It's they're just so impressionable, and it's you can literally access anything from a smartphone which on one hand is a huge advantage but on the other hand you don't know what these kids are getting into or what they're stumbling across so um yeah i i i definitely think screen time should be limited and um and if you are if you do have to use a phone like 
I have to use a phone for my job. It just, that's the reality of it. Um, I am slowly learning how to limit myself and be less of a passive consumer and more of a strategic content creator. I reckon it's tough though, like, because as you say, okay, we should be documenting our lives. And then you're like, oh, no, no, put your phone down. But in a modern world, you should be doing that and you should be um, encouraging um, the use of the latest technologies and things like that to, to help. So I feel like it's a real uh, tough, tough one sometimes because, you know, that is the way forward as well. And so are we just being, um, you know, a little bit old school and like, remember when I was young, do you know what I mean? Absolutely. I, and let me just clarify, I love hopping on the new innovation and technology trends. I want to be up to date with that. I just think for younger kids, it's so dangerous to pop them in front of a screen and let them spend hours upon hours just not using their brain at all. Like if they're spending hours in front of the television, then that is extremely passive consumption. Their imagination is being drained by the minute. Um, I, you just, you have to let them play outside and paint, draw, whatever they want to do. It just let them explore things that are not related to screens. And that, that is definitely a benefit that I had growing up homeschooled and growing up kind of before the computers were really a thing. Like I remember the cell phone my mom had was a razor flip phone. Like it just, I kind of grew with the technology and mm -hmm. um, was able to adapt but yeah just it's it's really sad honestly to see kids uh, like a one-year-old baby I I read this study where a one-year-old knew how to swipe on a smartphone but didn't know how to turn the page of a magazine <laughs> that was a real thing but it's terrifying. It I is. don't know. It just, it's sad. <laughs> yeah. I, I actually reckon we have no idea what we're creating now. You know, like there's just going to be this almost generation of probably not, not zombies, but you know what I mean? People are going to be <laughs> so addicted yeah. and just so anything. reliant. Yeah. You, you should, you should be able to have a life outside of screens and be adaptable rather than reliant on them. 100%. So, Anna, uh, what uh, exciting things have you got coming up in the next sort of few months or plans and things like that? Oh, my gosh. So, I mean, right now I'm just hardcore focused on this 30 paintings in 30 days challenge. Um, so, that for every single day in the month of September, I'm creating a painting. Um, and then, along with that, I'm doing a digital detox. So I'm, I've cut out all time on social media, except the one exception is to post my daily painting just to keep myself accountable. Um, but yeah, and it's amazing. I, I mean, I'm barely a week in and I already, I feel better. I've been getting up earlier. Mm -hmm. I've listened to five audiobooks and countless podcasts in the past week. Mm -hmm. And it just, it's such a difference what cutting out like Netflix and YouTube and all this different stuff. Cause you don't realize what kind of noise that creates in your brain until it's gone. It's really quite remarkable. So I'm full on enjoying just kind of having a quieter, more centered mind and not, not relying on social media to give me inspiration and really tapping into the inspiration that I had as a kid. You know, it's, it's, Honestly, it's getting back to five-year-old Hannah who would spend hours drawing and painting and coming up with these scenes from her own head. And I'm getting a little bit, a little bit of that imagination back. So it's pretty cool. Wow. It's very hard to be present when you're consuming. I think that, that I was just thinking about that now when you're saying that you just, it, you're always somewhere else. And, Absolutely. And not, Absolutely. Yeah. And I've, I've started meditating and that definitely has been a mood lifter. I've, I've dabbled with it in the past, but I've been doing it like a solid half hour 
every single day for the past week since the challenge started. And it is making me so much more mindful and present. And it's really pretty cool. Wow. And, and Hannah, why do you do challenges or why do people have these 30 day challenges? What, what's the point of it? And what do you think you get from it? The point of it for me. So I did it last year. This is the second year in a row that I'm doing it. And the point of it last year was to really get me out of probably the lowest point I've been at last summer. Just a lot of different things happened in my personal life that kind of piled on. And I felt very much in a creative slump, but also in sort of an emotional slump. And so I knew that committing to this challenge and dedicating time every single day to do what I truly loved would be so good for me. And sure enough, at the end of the month, I was surrounded by 30 pieces of some of the most passionate work that I've done and in such a different mindset. And so now this year, I'm approaching it with such a different I don't know, a different attitude. Like I, I'm, I wasn't in that dark place when I started. I was just rolling with Piper and working hard. And, um, and so starting in that already pretty high, happy place, I can't even imagine where I'll be at the end of the month. It's really exciting. And are the, and are the paintings, are they like ones that you're selling or these are just sort of for yourself? Yeah. So I've had a few inquiries off of Instagram because I'm posting every single painting on my story. I've had a few inquiries to purchase them. I will be selling them, but not until the end of, mo- end of the month. So I'll post all of them in my Etsy shop on October 1st. Um, but the, the core reason for that is it's not that I, I really don't have much in a, of an emotional attachment to my pieces. I have no problem selling my work. I just want to get the big epic photo at the end of the month with 30 of my paintings surrounding me. Cause that was my, maybe my favorite picture of last year. Cause it was the same thing. I just had 30 of my artwork, pieces of artwork around that's me and it was, it was really fun. So. Yeah. That's super inspiring and in such a great initiative. So well done for keeping at it. Cause it is tough to, to do that every single day. You know what I mean? Like, some people manage like three days and then they'll drop out or maybe like a week and then they drop out and 30 days is very impressive. Absolutely. Yeah. It it is hard. Last year I genuinely thought I was going to give up after a week or so. Um, but I didn't, I just, it became part of my routine. And so it's, I'm, I'm working into that sweet spot again this year. It's, it's just, it's so much fun. The thing about like having this passion is I know specifically what I can do to cheer myself up and how I enjoy spending my time. But so many people my age don't have that. And I, I blame a lot of that on school and, you know, the curriculum and just, they're not able to pursue what they're interested in. They have to follow this very strict Um, set of guidelines of what they need to get done and and what amount of time and so again homeschooling this is like coming full circle oddly enough but homeschooling really did give me the greatest gift that I can carry on for the rest of my life because I do know I know what I'm passionate about and what I enjoy doing and how I'm going to create my legacy you certainly changed my thoughts on the challenges actually was really awesome thank you because what I've seen with challenges is almost always a weight loss or a um, stopping. It's like a negative thing. Stop this or don't do this or whatever. But in your, like I hadn't, I hadn't really thought of it in that way in terms of uh, let's do more of something that makes me happy kind of challenge, you know? Exactly. Yeah. And it's the same thing. Like if I, if I wanted to cut out sugar, for example, which I have been more conscious of lately, (laughs) I will just substitute. And, you know, my favorite thing, instead of gravitating towards ice cream in the grocery store, (laughs) I have been absolutely loving frozen mango. This is such a weird tangent, (laughs) but I, I have frozen mango after my dinner every single day and it is the best thing ever. 
So yeah, it's just, it's learning how to enjoy the commitment that you're making. I like that. Living how to enjoy the commitment. That's an awesome, awesome way to almost finish. So and uh, what uh, we write a lot of show notes and stuff, and uh, you know, we obviously want people to find out more about you and where can they find out about you, website, social media, etc. Yeah, right. So you can uh, follow me on Instagram, see how the painting challenge is going at HP Media, or you can check out my website at hannahphillipsmedia.com. Um, yeah, you can reach out to me directly. I am always happy to meet new people and talk to people about their passions and, you know, just make that connection. It's fun. Oh, it's been an amazing chat, uh, Hannah. You're a really inspiring woman and I just, I'm just blown away with so much that you, that you're doing and your, your presence and your, um, composure, uh, is, is really inspiring. So I'm just super glad that we we got chatting uh, at the podcast conference because you know it's it's these kind of friendships and things that are so valuable down the track. So uh, I appreciate that uh, that you offered to take photos of us. <laughs> it was a really kind <laughs> and um, keep up the good work because I think it's inspiring for people of your age and younger, but also people of our age, but older than you that go like, you know what, like connect, reconnect with that youth, with the fun, with the, with the pleasures in life. And, uh, I think that's a really cool message that you, that you're putting out. And so, um, we're just super grateful, obviously for, for your time today and, and, uh, have a great, uh, week. And we're looking forward to seeing how everything goes and your art challenge with a big photo with, all your art pieces that's going to be awesome <laughs> well thank you so much for having me guys i am just so appreciative that you took the time to ask me about my story it's it's just really quite amazing i really appreciate it uh, it's a pleasure and yeah just a quick thank you from me craig you know always says thank you very well uh <laughs> it was it was just so awesome chatting to you like first of all you have such a good presence about you. You, you know, you, your energy is always high. You have a smile on your face. You have this sort of like spark in your eye or twinkle in your eye. <laughs> and it's just, it's just, it's so nice. Like Craig said, it's so nice seeing this energy and this sort of wise head on such a young, you know, young shoulders. You know what I mean? It's just really inspiring and, and keep doing the amazing work that you do. And you do motivate uh, not just people like that are your sort of same age, you know, or they probably really look up to you, but you motivate people that are sort of older than you, like Craig and I, you know, to, to be better, sort of to push ourselves to, um, to look at the world in a different way. And, you know, it's, uh, it's really, it's, it's sort of really inspiring just sitting back and listening to your story and seeing everything that you've achieved and you're not even 21. I mean, I'm <laughs> totally blown away. So, so really congratulations. And, and we wish you all the best in absolutely everything that you do. And I'm so glad that Craig went and sat next to you as well. And <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, it's just, uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. It has on my end too, guys. Thank you so much. Cool. Thank you. Cool <laughs> What's cool. great chat, Hannah? Yeah. It's amazing, amazing you job. Spoke so well. Yeah. Like really yeah. speak very well. So I mean, I'm sure you'll probably be doing talks and stuff in the future as well. Oh yeah. That's one yeah. of my goals. I'm visualizing yeah. it right now. Yeah, you must. You know, along with right. meditation, the visualization piece is <laughs> in there. Yeah. That's yeah. Awesome. You've got a lot to teach people for sure. You yeah, know. You do. Like, you totally got it and and you've got a like a like gareth and i we, we're not just saying those things i mean you really do have a good presence and um and and that's you know that that's so you, it's hard to learn that you know what i mean and, yeah. and you've just already got that so you know if you've got that and you i mean she's the sky's the limit for you it's seriously cool you guys have no idea how much that actually means to me because that's something that I have been consciously working on for such a long time now even even today in particular weirdly like I I told I told you how I'm kind of a believer in the law of attraction um, but today in particular I woke up in this very good headspace and the thought 
that just kept rotating in my head was radiate joy, radiate joy. And that's all I, all I really wanted to do. And, um, you, you guys are the second and third people who told me I had a good presence today. The other one randomly was, (laughs) was this cashier at the grocery store where I just went to buy some produce. Like she said, Oh my gosh, you are just, your smiling face. I'm loving it. She just, it was the weirdest Love thing, it. but Love yeah, it. but that is truly like all I want to do is make people feel good when they're around me. So, yeah, so awesome. I really appreciate well done, the Nick. kind words. You would do it in all different directions and wow. oh my gosh. So amazing. <laughs> it's cool, it's really cool, eh? <laughs> <laughs> Love Can we that. see it <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, I can show you another time, but <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I am I am the dorkiest dancer of all time, so I might pass on that, but yeah. <laughs> no, it sounds good. amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was interesting. Waking at dawn, packing the gear, September tour, and up in the air, stop at the toll.